Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Providing Medical Respite for People Experiencing Homelessness During COVID-19. Coordinated by the Center for Healthcare Strategies and the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council and made possible through support from the California Healthcare Foundation. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over a few logistics. To eliminate background noise, phone lines are being muted during today's event. There will be a moderated question answer session following today's presentations. You may submit a question online anytime by clicking the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your screen. Instructions are shown on the screen at this time. Today's event will be recorded and shared publicly on chcs.org. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you please complete a brief online evaluation that will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is very important to us, and we hope that you'll take a moment to do this. I will now turn the webinar over to Kathy Moses, Senior Fellow at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. And Kathy, you're on mute. Thanks, Travis. Apologies. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kathy Moses. I'm a senior fellow here at the Center for Healthcare Strategies, and I'm excited to welcome you to today's webinar. Um, next slide, please. I'm just going to get us started and then um, happy to turn it over to our wonderful uh, group of presenters today. Um, We'll have um, an overview, just kind of laying some groundwork and uh, terminology and understanding for what is medical respite. Um, and then we will hear from three programs, medical respite programs, including the Illumination Foundation and Santa Clara Medical Respite in California, as well as the Edward Thomas House Medical Respite in Washington State. Um, at that time, um, after that last presentation, we'll have time for question and answers and um, encourage you to submit questions as you think of them um, along the way. Next slide, please. I wanted to share just a little bit about um, our organization, the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Um, we are a nonprofit policy center dedicated to um, improving the health of low income Americans. We have a variety of um, portfolio areas that we work in, including um, complex populations work, which is where this webinar falls. Um, next slide. We are also really excited to be partnering with the California Healthcare Foundation, um, who is so generous to support this webinar, as well as a body of work focusing on, that, that we are um, performing, focusing on um, the role of COVID in uh, homelessness and healthcare. And so we've been developing a series of resources. Um, some are already up on CHCF's website um, that focus on what's happening from um, a managed care perspective, talking about Project Room Key and um, some of the innovations there, um, a managed alcohol program that started during COVID as a response to COVID and Project Room Key, um, uh, among perspectives from folks like United Way and health plans. So we encourage you to um, visit the California Healthcare Foundation website for these resources. Um, and, and today's webinar, um, and, and sort of a multimedia piece instead of being a blog or a written um, um, piece on, on one of these perspectives, we're sharing um, not just a local California perspective, but also national um, by pulling in the National Healthcare um, for the Homeless Council, as well as um, a, a Washington State medical respite provider as well. So um, again, this also will serve as, as one of those resources. And um, as Travis has mentioned, we'll, we'll have slides and recording to share with you um, after the webinar. So with that, I would like to pass it off to um, this, my colleague, Michelle Schneiderman at the California Healthcare Foundation. She's the director of High Value Care and has been working with us on um, developing these resources. So Michelle, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Kathy. 
The California Healthcare Foundation is very excited to sponsor today's webinar <clears throat> as part of our emerging portfolio on homelessness and healthcare. Thank you all for attending. I am so appreciative of the preparation and thoughtfulness that the speakers have put into the development of today's webinar and I want to express my deep gratitude to the Center for Healthcare Strategies, the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, the National Institute on Medical Respite Care, as well as our esteemed speakers. The topic of medical respite is very near and dear to my heart. <clears throat> In a previous life, about 14 years ago, I took on one of the most exciting, uh, humbling, and life-changing roles of my career as the medical director of San Francisco's brand new medical respite program. Since that time, the role and value of medical respite programs has become increasingly more clear, and the COVID pandemic has really crystallized it in ways you'll hear about today. I'll now hand things over to Julia Dobbins, the Director of Programs and Services for the National Institute for Medical Respite Care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. I really appreciate it. And I am really thrilled to be here today with you guys talking about medical respite care. And I, my name is Julia Dobbins. I work for the National Health Care for the Homeless Council. And I'm also here today representing our newest initiative, the National Institute for Medical Respite Care. So the council has been working with the Respite Care Providers Network for almost 20 years, and they've really guided national work on medical respite care. And that's what led to the creation of this new National Institute for Medical Respite Care, which just launched a few weeks ago. And really the goal of the Institute is to expand medical respite services across the country. There are still several communities, indeed several states that don't have medical respite beds. Um, and we also wanna ensure that programs that already exist or that are in development are really focused on meeting the standards of care for medical respite, that they're focused on trauma-informed care and harm reduction, that they are anti-racist in their practices and their partnerships, and that they are remaining patient-centered in their work. So the reason we're here today is because we know about the connection between homelessness and poor health. We know that poor health causes homelessness. We know that homelessness causes new health problems and exacerbates existing ones. We know the experience of homelessness makes it harder to engage in care and receive appropriate services. And we also know, unfortunately, that our neighbors who are unhoused on average die 30 years earlier than their housed counterparts. So we know that the effect of homelessness is quite literally killing some of our neighbors. We also know the impact of homelessness and health affects our hospitals and our hospital systems. So we know that people who do not have a safe place to go after a hospital stay are staying in the hospital on average 4.1 days longer than people who are housed. We also know that people without homes are using the ED more frequently and they have a higher rate of 30 day ED readmission rates and inpatient readmission rates. So that's what brings us to this conversation about medical respite care. So, I'm sure there are several people on this call who are very familiar with medical respite, and there may be some folks who are new to respite. So I just wanna take a second to get us all on the same page. So we define medical respite care as acute and post-acute care for people experiencing homelessness who are too ill or frail to recover from an illness or injury on the street or in shelter, but who are not sick enough to require hospital level care. So it's short-term residential care that allows people the opportunity to rest, to recover, and to heal in a safe environment while also accessing medical care and supportive services. Whenever we talk about medical respite care, we want to be really clear about what medical respite care is and what it is not. So I want to be clear that medical respite is not skilled nursing, it's not nursing home care, it's not assisted living, it's not supportive housing. And there are two primary components that separate medical respite from services like that. One is respite is short-term in nature. So the idea is that somebody comes into respite, they are stabilized, they heal, they're connected to resources, and then they're discharged hopefully to another stable place. We don't want people staying in respite care for too long. 
Second, when people come into medical respite care, it's important that they are independent in their activities of daily living. So they have to be able to feed themselves, bathe themselves, go to the bathroom independently. Um, otherwise, they would need bedside care. And that's just a higher level of care than what's being provided in respite. So really think of this as if somebody had a home to be discharged to, then they would be discharged home with some support. Um, because respite is at its nature a grassroots movement, there is a lot of diversity in programming. If you've seen one respite program, you've probably just seen one respite program. There is no one size fits all. So there's a lot of diversity in bed number, facility type, length of stay, staffing. I'm not going to go into that too much because we have three awesome programs who are going to talk a little bit about the differences in their length of stay, staffing, and referral sources. Another thing I want to be really clear about, we get this question all the time, is what is the difference between medical respite care and recuperative care? There is no difference between medical respite and recuperative care. We use these terms interchangeably. Some of this is, lo is a local issue. It seems like in California, more programs are referred to as recuperative care programs than anywhere else in the country, but the service is the same. There is no specific requirement for medical, for the amount of clinical care being provided in a respite program. And medical respite is not more of a clinical version than a recuperative care program. Again, there's a lot of diversity in what programs look like, but what they're providing is the same service. The reason the Respite Care Providers Network adopted the term medical respite was on the grounds that it was more encompassing than the literal meaning of the term recuperative. So they wanted to describe that what's happening in respite in a recuperative care bed is more than just a place for somebody to rest. So while there's a lot of diversity in respite programs, there are four primary components that exist for all respite. So one, there does need to be some type of clinical oversight. And this really sets the referral into a recuperative care or respite program and the length of stay in respite. What that clinical care looks like is completely up to you. It could be clinical staff that you have. It could be a relationship with the hospital where home health is coming in to provide that care. Case management is another core component of respite. While people are recovering and healing, we wanna make sure they're getting connected to all of the resources in their community, especially around housing and mental health or behavioral health care. Integration into primary care is also really important because we wanna make sure that people are connected to a healthcare home before they leave respite. With the idea of we want people appropriately, appropriately using the healthcare system and not only going to the emergency room. And then finally, the self-management and support piece is really important. People in respite are very active in their own recovery. Respite is a great opportunity for rest, reflection, practice, health education. It's a great time for people to practice taking their meds um, and just learn how to self-manage a little bit better once they leave medical respite. So we know of about 100 respite programs across the country with at least 20 in development. I'm sure there's more than that. Respite has grown exponentially in the last five years, particularly in California. And I think that's related to your 1115 waiver and respite being included in that. Um, we know that a quarter of respite programs are located in California. Again, I think that's related to your 1115 waiver and also related to the need. Um, we know the homeless population in California is, is pretty high. We also know that across the board, the average length of stay in a respite program is around 30 days. Although again, like I said, there's a lot of diversity in respite care. So for some programs, their average length of stay may be two weeks. And for others, it may go as high as 60 or 90 days. But on average, we're seeing about 30 days. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on funding because again, our, our programs are gonna talk a little bit about their funding and funding is always a very complex conversation. Uh, but I just wanna acknowledge that there generally seems to be three buckets that funding falls into. So the clinical services piece, supportive services and room and board. And medical respite lives right at the center of these three. So that's something that respite programs really have to work with is how are they um, developing their sustainable funding plan. And we know that most respite programs are partnering with either a, a hospital that's doing their referrals 
and or uh, some managed care organizations to provide some of that financial support. So I mentioned earlier about uh, programs really centering themselves around the standards of care. So the Respite Care Providers Network over a five year period developed standards for respite programs. And the reason for this is we saw that respite programs were growing and we wanted to make sure that we're all clear about what we mean by respite. And we wanna make sure that um, respite programs are providing quality care and are not doing harm to an already vulnerable population. So I will add the link to the standards in the chat once I finish speaking, but just generally there are seven standards and several criteria under each standard. And this is really a document to help communities build their programming. So we know that there are a lot of advantages to medical respite care. It offers a safe and cost-effective discharge option. It connects vulnerable patients to a broad range of community care and public benefits. It improves health by addressing most immediate health needs, develops more comprehensive care plan and coordinates care across venues. And it really provides time and space for healing and for health education. And while we know there are a lot of advantages for respite, we also know that it is just the right thing to do. Ensuring that people have a safe place to be when they are sick is our responsibility in a civilized society. And I think that has become even more apparent in the last several months related to this pandemic. And respite programs have really demonstrated their value over the last several months. And respite programs have had to be really nimble in their response to COVID. And that's what we're gonna move into now is hearing from some really incredible programs that have, um, are well established and have been working really hard over the last several months to adjust to this pandemic. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Pooja to talk to us about the Illumination Foundation. Thank you so much. Hi everybody. First I want to start out by saying thank you to Kathy and Michelle and Julia to bring us all together as we all navigate um, in the new world of COVID and how we um, in the world of medical respite have been um, having to operationalize our pro program. So Julia did a great job of explaining medical respite, you know, what it does, the purpose, the vision behind it, and, and the value, you know, that it brings to the healthcare system. And as she said, when you see one medical respite program, you've seen one medical respite program. Each of us, um, you know, in our um, areas have unique as to what we do and how it's funded and who our partners are. And at the same time, there's a lot of similarities. So I'll start out by telling you a little bit about how we got started and then move on to what's happening today as we live in the new world of COVID. So back in 2007, our founding CEO, Paul Leon, was working at the healthcare agency as a public health nurse where he would encounter homeless individuals and was trying to really provide the highest quality care and making sure that they were managing their care as they saw him. And one evening he happened to go look for a, a homeless individual who was living in this armory and witnessed this scene uh, where you could see families, um, single adults, single moms, just in this armory um, where there was a place to be. And he would go there day after day trying to bring the care services that they needed. And that was the beginning of his um, journey to starting Illumination Foundation. He um, decided that at the time in Orange County, homelessness, the numbers were increasing and there needed to be a system of care. And that is how um, Illumination Foundation started. Right from the beginning, it's always been the philosophy here that we need to not only just bring access to healthcare to these individuals, but connect them to a system of care 
and also break that cycle of homelessness by getting them into housing. So it's been built on the premise of housing is healthcare. And when you look at our programs around the country, we all, we all live this mission and breathe this mission that we need to make sure not only are we bringing healthcare services, but how do we disrupt that cycle of homelessness and how do we actually move individuals into housing? At the time when the program started, hospitals in California were struggling with trying to um, discharge homeless individuals. And that is what um, gave birth to the recuperative care program, where we started accepting the highest utilizers of the hospitals. These are the individuals who were either living on the streets, couldn't really manage being in a shelter because of the mental health issues, were showing up in the hospitals and at the emergency rooms day in, day out, that's where Illumination Foundation was approached and said, is there a way we can provide services to these individuals while trying to keep them out of the hospital, especially the EDs, which was not the appropriate place since they did not have any acute medical issues or urgent issues at the time. And that's when LA County uh, Inland Empire and Orange County, we partnered with many hospitals to start the recuperative care program and quickly realized that, as Julia mentioned, the recuperative care, the medical respite program, the length of stay is limited and partly because it's limited by the funding, um, but how do we continue to stabilize the population? And very quickly, we needed to come together and work on housing solutions. So when we talk about you know, what we do at Illumination Foundation, we always start with Recuperative care and housing are sort of the foundation. Recuperative care is a place where individuals, you know, enter into a system of care where we stabilize their medical issues, work with them, address the mental health issues, but at the same time, how do we continue to move them into a housing opportunity? And I'll, I'll show you some data that, that speaks to the importance of stabilizing in recuperative care. So today we are running six recuperative care sites, medical respite sites across Southern California in LA County, in Inland Empire, in Orange County. And this week we will be opening our newest facility, which is going to be our largest facility in the city of Fullerton in Orange County, um, which will add another 60 beds. And we have another 50 beds coming online uh, in the city of Santa Ana by the end of the year. And this really came from us having to uh, work with our partners, especially our shelter partners and our hospital partners who uh, have been discharging homeless individuals to us but need more capacity. So we continue to add more capacity. Today we have 250 beds. By the end of the year, we will have 300 recuperative care beds throughout Southern California. And thankfully, um, you know, the funding stream here in California has been through the whole person care program, which is funded through the 1115 waiver, which really allows um, the payer in Orange County, it's Caloptima, who works with the county healthcare agency to deliver the recuperative care medical respite program. And that is why we've been able to add so much capacity because there is funding available for these individuals. However, I'm going to put a plug out there now, as many of you probably know, um, the waiver ends December 31st of 2020. And there's a lot of work happening from the payer side and the healthcare agency side to advocate to CMS for this program. As you'll see in the for the slides, the impact this program has on uh, not just the lives of the individuals we take care of, but also the overall healthcare system. Our referral source for our whole person care medical respite program is primarily coming from the hospitals and the street outreach teams. The hospitals are identifying, again, uh, individuals who have medical issues who can't go back to a shelter or can't be on the street and needs a comprehensive set of services to really manage the population. This program was really um, the program that highlighted to our hospital partners and uh, our payers and the healthcare agency 
the success that recuperative care program has had. And I'll just point out a couple of things. It's a busy slide, but again, we took early on as part of our first recuperative care pilot program, took on 38 of the highest utilizers of the hospitals, um, come into recuperative care program where we had nurses, social workers, um, therapists, counselors, KDACs, working with them, case managers, and really building that relationship and connecting them to the appropriate healthcare services throughout the program. Many of them we were able to, actually 95% of them we were able to get into housing because at the same time we were able to um, get our HUD program up and running. So these individuals were able to stabilize and get into permanent supportive housing. But the piece I want to highlight is after the program, you could see there was an 84% reduction in the ER visits. And again, you know, as um, Julia already highlighted, the whole premise of recuperative care is the triple aim. How can we increase quality care? How can we manage the population health for individuals experiencing homelessness, but do it in a cost efficient manner? and provide the comprehensive services that all um, our individuals need. And that's been sort of the focus and we continue to look at that as we build more capacity. Highlighting a little bit of data here, which really speaks to, again, the triple aim decreased cost. Our data has shown, and this data, by the way, was provided to us through CalOptima, which is our Medi-Cal program in Orange County, um, which uh, sends us a lot of our recuperative care clients through the county. And you could see 93% cost reduction post recuperative care. Individuals come in, some have 30 days days, sometimes 60 days, sometimes you know 45 days, depending on what's happening with them medically. But at the same time, we're also increasing primary care access. And the graph there shows the red bar on the right-hand side for individuals, 803 uh, individuals who came through our medical respite program came in and were not accessing the primary care program. However, working with the team they were accessing um, the healthcare system in an appropriate way because we were able to get them to understand how important it is and how do we actually navigate going to the appointments. We have the case managers and the social workers working them closely, working with them closely to get them to the doctors. And you can see a growth by 81% in primary care. Um, the data on the right hand side just shows the housing outcome. We right from the beginning when someone's coming into recuperative care, are working with them, getting them on the continuum of care, the CES system, doing the VI spadats, and getting them eligible for all the benefits you know, that they should be getting. Um, and you can see the length of stay is directly correlated to housing outcomes. Folks who stay up to 90 days, 29% uh, of them get into housing, but as that number grows, you can see the great success in moving people into housing. Here's another program. Just one thing I wanna highlight. This again is a recuperative care program. I'll highlight on the left-hand side, the 58% of the individuals coming through the recuperative care program have severe and persistent mental illness. I wanna point out the criteria to get into medical respite here uh, um, at Illumination Foundation through the county has been limited to homeless individuals who are experiencing uh, acute medical issue. It can't be, mental health issue can't be the primary issue that they're being referred for. They will get in through the door if they have an acute medical issue. But our data showed from CalOptima that 58% of the population coming in had severe and persistent mental illness. And here in Orange County, this population really belongs in a full service partnership where they are supposed to be in the separate program that is much more comprehensive, but for whatever reason, this population that came through recuperative care did not access those programs. And we had to um, mobilize our teams, add more therapists, add more substance use counselors to really support them and a psychiatrist and a medical mobile health team 
to really support this population because for whatever reason, they are not able to access those county full service partnerships. This program again highlights the success and the impact it's made on the healthcare system. You could see 83% reduction in inpatient costs and 46% in ER costs. And here we are today, um, you know, 12 years later, you could see how many folks we've seen in the past uh, 12 plus years, we've served over 6,500 individuals who have needed medical respite. Uh, and we know that number is a lot, lot larger, uh, but we continue to build capacity to meet the need for the hospitals and the healthcare system. And at the same time, you can also see how many individuals have been housed through our program. We've served over 10,000 families and individuals who've come through uh, one program or the other uh, at IEF and have been housed in the IF programs. At Illumination Foundation, we have the HUD program and we also have uh, other programs where some individuals who are able to get stable and maybe get a job can pay a little bit of their rent dollars where we will uh, have, we call them micro communities, small homes where individuals, five homeless individuals who are now stable, some of them may have a job, can now actually manage paying rent. So we have been able to house a lot more individuals that way through the micro community program. All right, so let me now switch to, you know, COVID-19 where all of us are, are living this every day and hoping, you know, it'll, it won't be long, but it looks like, you know, it's gonna continue and all of us need to um, be nimble and continue to run our organizations and, and take care of the homeless population who has um, either symptoms or are positive. So back on the weekend of March 21st, we were called upon by the healthcare agency and the board of supervisors in Orange County to help them lead the efforts for COVID-19 in Orange County. We very quickly got together with our board of directors, our executive team, worked on a program, presented it to them Monday morning, and by Tuesday, we were asked to operationalize this program. And through Project Room Key, as many of you know, you know, has been uh, Governor Newsom's efforts to really um, assist the homeless individuals who are vulnerable, 65 and older, and also individuals who struggle with um, medical issues to really uh, remove them from the shelter settings and bring them in and isolate them. So we very quickly were uh, asked to put this together. Within the first two weeks, we opened three sites. And by the end of four weeks, we opened six motel sites through Project Room Key. Two of them were um, COVID positive sites and the other four sites were meant to be for homeless individuals who are vulnerable that were living in the shelters. And because we had to decrease density in the shelters, we had to um, bring those folks in into these settings. The reason for the six sites is Orange County has over 22 different cities and we had to make sure that we had locations that were accessible to the hospitals and the shelters in each of the service planning areas of the county. Um, one quick story, uh, in South County, we got our first hotel site and because of the neighborhood uh, opposition and nimbyism, we couldn't open that site. Two days later, our staff has moved in. We're ready to accept our first client who was on his way uh, from a hospital. We were asked again to shut down the site because of the community opposition. Um, long story short, a couple of days later, you know, after some legal settlements, we were able to open that site. So today we're running six different sites, two are COVID positives and symptomatic and the other four motel sites are for the vulnerable population. You can see the numbers here. Um, this, this is our per data that we've tracked ourselves. We, out of the um, 1500 individuals that have come through our program, we have 205 individuals um, who came back positive. Uh, some were symptomatic, but you know, ended up 
um, being negative. However, I believe this number is higher because we all know there's been issues with the test, but this is the number that we have. And as of today, we have 620 individuals in our program. So let me take a couple minutes to kind of talk about how we had to start this program and all the protocols we had to put in place. Um, in the first 24 hours of starting this program, we had to get together our staff. We ended up hiring over 150 staff members. Um, we used a lot of our recuperative care staff to help us get started. We worked with our uh, other partners to bring some more staff on board. But we had to go to the shelters and meet the individuals and explain the importance of them coming out of their environment because of their medical issues and getting them into a much more safer um, place. So we had our medical mobile team, our case managers, our drivers, our site staff who went to nine different shelters in a span of um, three days to bring individuals into these settings. We did the referrals on site. We had to make sure they knew where they were going, how many belongings they could bring. So from going to site, meeting them, accepting them, all of that we were able to do uh, within 48 hours and bringing um, hundreds of individuals into these programs. One of the things we implemented right when we uh, were notified that we would be leading this program is every morning at 7.30, our executive leadership and our senior management, along with other managers who were running these programs would come together and go through our facilities, infrastructure, what do the operations look like? What do we need to modify? Most importantly, staff safety. Do we have enough PPE on board? Uh, what is our testing protocol? How are we gonna do the test? Who's gonna pick them up? Where are they gonna be delivered? And we quickly had to put systems in place. For instance, at our COVID positive site, which has three different floors, we had to figure out one floor for the individuals that are confirmed positives another floor for individuals that are still waiting for results and another floor for individuals that are in quarantine that were direct contacts but needed to actually still isolate so we had to create donning and doffing stations on each of these sites we had to make sure every person coming in who hadn't been tested got tested right away with the appropriate protocol um, lab tests had to be dropped off and results you know, have to be checked off. And then we're communicating back and forth with the public health department and the shelters who continued at the time back in April and May and all the way up to June actually had some outbreaks. Um, there was one point one day I remember, I think we took in 45 individuals from one of the shelters because they had 12 positive cases. And a lot of the um, direct contacts, you know, were either having symptoms or needed to really be isolated right away. And we were also asked to take on individuals 24 hours a day. So we had to staff up our referral team um, to make sure we could actually accommodate folks coming in um, from the hospitals because the hospitals really needed us at the time and we did uh, except referrals 24 hours a day. Just a couple data points for the population who came in. Um, you can see the age range is there, but sadly, um, you know, a lot of the population coming in was on the younger side and the COVID positive side, which is the second um, bar where it says COVID county isolation shelter, um, sadly, about 70% of the population was under the age of 55. So you can see 22% were 45 to 54, 20% were 35 to 44. Uh, and this you know, speaks to what we've been seeing. Folks that are uh, experiencing homelessness have complex medical issues, multiple comorbidities, and um, you know, contract COVID-19 at a higher rate. And, and it, completely confirms that with this data that 70% of the population was under the age of 55 who came into our COVID positive site. Um, speaking about the health disparity, we've all heard about this. We all see it, witness it every day. Again, in our COVID positive site, 
51% of the population sadly was Hispanic Latino, which again confirms, you know, the disparity in our healthcare system that we have and, and how this population really needs higher quality care. So here we are um, today, and you can see 91% of this population came from the streets and the shelters. And now the program, as we know, as of today, is going to be ending on September 30th. So we need to figure out very quickly where many of these individuals are going to be um, discharged to. And we are working with the healthcare agency to um, come up with an appropriate discharge plan. But at the same time, we also saw the medical burden that these individuals um, experience and many of them actually need medical respite. So we're partnering with the healthcare agency uh, and our other homeless providers to really bring um, this population to the appropriate level of care. And I will stop there. Thank you. Great, thanks Pooja. I love this last slide and your um, the quote from Winston Churchill. So next we'd like to turn it over to Sara Javanji. She's the medical director at Santa Clara Medical Respite Program. Sarah, take it away. All right, thank you, Kathy. And thank you, Julia and the Center for Healthcare Strategies for inviting me to participate today. Um, so I'm just going to start with a brief kind of overview and background of our program and try to spend most of the time talking about um, some of our response to COVID-19 since uh, March. But um, going back to our beginnings, in March 2007, there was a Blue Ribbon Commission convened by one of the supervisors in Santa Clara County on ending homelessness. and. In the report, it included a recommendation to start a medical respite program. Uh, the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program, which we are a part of, which is a healthcare for the homeless program that is a part of the county's uh, health system, uh, submitted funding to HRSA, submitted a funding request to HRSA for additional staffing to support a respite program, which was granted. And in November 2008, the program opened its doors uh, with 15 beds. Six years later, we expanded to 20 beds, and six years later, here we are. Um, so this is just uh, some background on what our program looked like pre-COVID, and as I'll talk about, things have changed significantly since then, but we are a shelter-based program. Um, we are based in the largest homeless shelter in San Jose. We had 20 beds in uh, 10 double occupancy rooms that were built out of the side of the shelter, as you can see in the pictures. Uh, there is an on-site FQHC operated by our homeless program, which is where we provided clinical services. And then I kind of listed our staffing FTE there and just to kind of point out, I think similar to other programs and similar to the composition of our uh, teams really at all of our healthcare sites within the homeless program. You know, there's in addition to nursing and medical providers, there's um, a lot of behavioral health and social work support. All of our staff are part of the homeless program and we do have additional staff, um, a postdoc psychology and an outreach worker that um, through community benefits grant funding. And then uh, just to go through our funding sources. So um, all the staff are empl employed by Santa Clara County and the clinics are operated under the county health system. We also receive additional funding through HRSA. Uh, and then the hospitals, there's nine county hospitals that refer to our program and they pay annually. Uh, and that money is actually put towards uh, a lease that we have with the shelter, which covers basically room and board and the uh, shelter services. And as I mentioned, we have community benefits grants that we've applied for um, to support additional staffing, shelter beds, and um, continuous case management services. Most of our referrals come from uh, the county hospitals, but we do also get referrals from outpatient clinics, especially oncology clinic, and the homeless program for those with an acute medical need. Uh, so here's a long list of community partners, but I think just to kind of organize it. So there's the folks that uh, 
help with program funding and resources, as I mentioned, the county and then the Hospital Council of Northern and Central California, which is really the body that kind of organizes the contracts, MOUs, uh, obtaining payments from the participating hospitals every year. Um, Home First is a nonprofit that operates the shelter where we were previously located. And then the Office of Supportive Housing, you'll hear a lot about um, in the next few minutes. So they are the county's office that is working to expand the stock of housing for vulnerable populations in Santa Clara County. Uh, these are some of the hospitals that support us with community benefits grant funding. And then we have um, community-based organizations that we collaborate with for client support and housing resources. Uh, this is the first of many busy slides that I have. So there's a lot of text that um, I think you can download the slides. So just for reference later, but uh, just to say that we, um, when folks are admitted to medical respite, we uh, enroll them in HMIS. And so we've been able to tailor our enrollment and exit survey to kind of meet our needs. And then, you know, the things that we collect are partly, you know, for program, um, improvement and growth and also for our stakeholders. So I've kind of listed some of the things that we collect for different stakeholders. Uh, I didn't really put um, numbers for our program here, but just to give you guys an idea, in 2019 we had 308 accepted referrals. The most common reason why we turn people away is about a quarter were turned away just for lack of bed availability. And about a third of our denials are because folks either need sniff level care or not sufficiently independent. Incontinence is often is a pretty common reason why we aren't able to take folks. Uh, the length of stay, as Julia had mentioned, ours was hovering around 30 days and had, uh, but in the last year, actually creeped up significantly to 39.5 days. And I think a lot of that is just finding places. Um, other stable supportive settings for folks to go after respite, as well as just seeing uh, folks that just needed a longer length of stay, often for um, oncology patients. Um, most frequently, we were discharging uh, folks to uh, the shelter, as well as transitional housing programs, often transitional mental health programs that we worked closely with. So uh, I'm gonna kind of launch into the COVID-19 response now. And this slide is really trying to give um, a big picture about the response uh, in Santa Clara County, uh, the countywide response to addressing COVID-19 among unhoused individuals. And the our homeless program was very closely involved with developing this plan. And it included, um, as you can see, um, you know, uh, containment through isolation of those who tested positive in specific hotels for folks who are COVID positive, and mitigation through trying to move people who are vulnerable into motels, which I'll talk more about, expansion of shelter options for folks, and then increased testing with mass testing in encampments and congregate sites. And of course, with all of this, uh, you know, the program pretty much completely pivoted our services uh, to basically providing um, care to folks at these various sites to developing a massive new telehealth operation, uh, which was dubbed Mo Telehealth, and to increasing outreach to those with ongoing increased risk of exposure. Um, so unlike, I think, uh, you know, where Pujo's program was really doing a lot of work with folks who were COVID positive, we really were focusing um, on, we were providing services to those who were not testing positive. And so, and these errors are actually slightly off, but I think, uh, so really um, that arrow on the left should be for uh, next to placement in, of the medically vulnerable in motels, which is where uh, we, where respite came in. So, um, the homeless program actually worked to help develop the medical vulnerability criteria for, um, to identify those who we thought would be the highest risk for getting um, severe illness if exposed to coronavirus and basically placing those folks into motels. And so the majority of respite clients really actually met that medical vulnerability criteria and we were prioritized early on 
for placement into the motels. Um, we actually relocated to motel two days after the Bay Area's shelter in place order went into effect. Uh, and this is really in large part because of the work of the partners um, who have all, these are a lot of the folks that have been uh, involved in the countywide COVID response. And then I just have some arrows that are aligning correctly for the folks that uh, we particularly worked, we worked closely with um, for uh, providing services out of a motel. And so specifically the Office of Supportive Housing was um, funding the motels, uh, you know, working on FEMA reimbursement and, um, and developing contracts with the motels, with all the service providers who were also providing services at the motels. And that included abode services, which is the Bay Area's largest homeless housing and services provider. And they provided site coordination at the, at, um, the motel where we were located. So they managed food distribution, laundry services, dealing with uh, site-related issues that came up. And of course, we collaborated with motel management who also became important partners and valuable partners um, in uh, our new operations. So um, just to kind of talk more specifically about what our operations look like uh, in response to COVID-19, so, uh, you know, I really think the idea was really to be able to both reduce the risk of exposure for our medically vulnerable um, clients, as well as uh, being able to expand our capacity so that we could offload hospitals in anticipation of a surge. And we were anticipating a surge in mid-April, uh, expanded our program to 40 beds in anticipation of that, and then that surge never really hit, but we just wanted to make sure that we were kind of able to um, help hospitals maintain capacity. And so we have since contracted our census back down to 30 beds. Uh, I think there's a lot of kind of modifications that uh, to our operations that have happened uh, in response both to COVID-19 and to just operating out of a motel. So, um, you know, little things like having to um, move from our high-tech fax space system of referrals to email, um, but also coordinating with the um, Office of Supportive Housing in terms of uh, the hotline. They actually were, there was a hotline that was being used that individuals could call to get placed into either motels or shelters based on their age and medical uh, conditions. And so, and discharge planners could call that hotline as well. And so I think it's been a continuous work in progress to kind of help discharge planners know when to call respite, when to call the hotline, um, and making sure that those folks who do have a respite need are directed towards us instead of the hotline. Um, we also, you know, we stopped doing groups. We stopped transporting clients to appointments in our own vehicle. We did that through uh, clients were then transported to visits via taxi vouchers and then implemented a few new practices, um, including daily temperature and symptom screening, which of course was important to make sure that anyone that screened positive was swabbed right away. Um, but also almost equally as important was, you know, we, all these rooms were single occupancy and folks we're behind closed doors and, you know, there's just much less visibility of our clients um, in this new facility. And so it was really an opportunity to kind of lay eyes on folks every day, see how they're doing, see how their room is doing, um, and kind of get a sense of what people's needs are. Uh, we also, you know, Prior to when, when we were in the shelter, our team had our own process and set up rules for clients. And now being in the motel and working alongside Abode and kind of under the contract of the Office of Supportive Housing, we um, needed to coordinate with other agencies to ensure alignment on rules, communication about admissions and discharges, collaborate on addressing issues that arose with clients, especially in regards to damage to motel property or you know even small things like clients getting locked out after hours um 
We uh, also were seeing a lot of telehealth, both from providers within our program and then a lot of specialty and PCP visits were now be, um, occurring via telehealth, which was actually difficult for a lot of our clients. Some of them did not have phones. Some of them just didn't answer their phones when they had a scheduled visit. And we were able to use some grant funds to purchase phones for our clients and also um, phones for a program that could be used as numbers for clinics to call for scheduled visits. Um, and then of course, uh, we're providing medical services out of a motel. And so pictured here, you can see our mobile medical unit, um, which came once a week for, uh, for me to see clients. And uh, I think it's also worth mentioning that this site was only about 50% only about of the residents there were part of the respite program. And then um, the other 50% were placed there by the county for, and were other medically vulnerable um, individuals. So there, this mobile clinic was also able to come to uh, with other providers to see um, non-respite individuals as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think just reflecting on the things that have worked well and the things that have been challenging in the past few months, you know, of course the um, the greatest benefit has been able to has been our ability to reduce the risk of exposure to coronavirus for our clients um, by removing them from the congregate setting. Uh, I think other benefits are, you know, being in this site, we've been able to be a little bit more flexible. And so, um, for example, we were able to accommodate partners and caregivers, which we previously were unable to do. Uh, it didn't necessarily make our lives easier, but it did um, enable people who otherwise probably would not have been able to access our services to come to our program. And similarly, I think not being in the shelter, there was more willingness on um, uh, clients' uh, part to come to medical respite. We, uh, because there was a coordinated county process for um, allocating shelter and motel beds for folks, we were able to kind of plug into that for when folks were ready to graduate from respite or were getting exited um, to make sure that they had a bed to go to. We also had diabetic diets for the first time ever, which um, was exciting, except that a lot of our diabetic patients didn't like them, the diet. So. And uh, fortunately, none of the residents at the motel have actually tested positive so far. Some of the challenges that we had, you know, as I mentioned, I think one of the things that's been hardest is just monitoring patients behind closed doors. And so there's really been more on-site consumption and intoxication, which is just concerning since there's, um, there isn't a lot of visibility, rooms getting damaged, uh, accumulation of belongings, food going bad in the rooms. Um, as well as just being, and then, you know, being on site with other medically vulnerable clients and having to really have boundaries in terms of who the population is we're serving there. Uh, social distancing has been difficult to enforce on site and is a continuous work in progress. Uh, you know, lice and bed bugs continue to be an issue. And I think one of the biggest things is really this question of what's next. Um, there's a lot of anxiety on the part of our uh, clients and other um, clients staying at the motel in terms of um, this question of when are these hotel rooms, uh, when are they going to have to leave the hotel rooms, which is still uncertain, and where are they going to go. So I think just to uh, wrap up, so lessons learned. Uh, I think community partnerships have always been essential in the work we do and in medical respite care, but never, um, but now more than ever, the adaptations in our program were really part of a much broader coordinated countywide response and we couldn't have made any of these changes without working closely with our partners. Um, and I think, as I've mentioned, some people have really thrived in the um, motel rooms and others have frankly languished and not done as well. Uh, and I didn't, you know, I didn't talk a lot about this, but I think uh, as Julia had kind of mentioned, in terms of what respite care is and isn't, we really provide care for folks who are independent with their ADLs. And that has kind of created a gap in care for folks who, um, between kind of medical respite care and skilled nursing care, where there's a lot of folks who just need more custodial support um, because of the prevalence of 
you know, cognitive and physical impairments among our population. And those gaps still exist. And we were seeing a lot of people getting placed in the motels that weren't able to adequately care for themselves. Um, and again, telehealth has been uh, touted as this great new model of care delivery that we all hope will continue post pandemic. And it is great for those um, who it works for, but we were just seeing that it's challenging for a lot of our population. And finally, just to end with, you know, I think when there is political will and momentum, we have witnessed that we can move 2000 individuals indoors in the span of months. It does involve everyone dropping everything else that they're doing, but uh, it's been um, amazing and it's to witness this um, as a result of the enormous effort of so many dedicated people. And so with that, I will finish. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. That's a, a great point. The um, sheer power of will and moving, moving, pulling all in one direction um, can move mountains for sure. So um, I'd like to now present our last presenter. Leslie Enzian is the medical director of the Edward Thomas House Medical Respite Center, and it is in Seattle, Washington. Leslie, over to you. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate being invited to join this conversation and to learn about the other programs that just presented and to share information about our program. Um, I have worked for the County Hospital in Seattle for the past 25 years and have worked in many different capacities over that time and worked with our medical respite program from the time that it started. Um, and I would say that my work with respite by far has been the most rewarding of all the different roles that I have worked in. And that is really due to this significant potential for long-term impacts that um, can happen in respite. And I see respite patients in my primary care clinic um, and over the years have just recognized repeatedly that um, the rest, a medical respite stay can be the pivotal experience that can lead to long-term medical and social stabilization. Um, so it's been very exciting to be involved with our program long-term. Um, I will be talking about uh, respite and the COVID response on a smaller scale than the two prior very impressive programs and from a lens of our um, relatively small respite program and how we supported the bigger picture of the COVID response in our area. So our program opened in 1996 with the HUD supportive housing grant and we were a shelter-based program at that time. We started with 12 beds at, at a men's and a separate women's facility and then within a year due to demand expanded to 22 beds and um, this is a picture of the men's site and we had a separate wing of Salvation Army shelter with hospital beds and then we had one private room for patients who required that for, um, for example for colonoscopy preparations or other medical issues that required that. And um, over time um, we realized that there were um, numerous limitations to having a shelter-based program. And one was that it limited the acuity of patients that we could care for. Additionally, the shelter staff oversaw behavioral management and many of the shelter staff um, were previous clients at the shelter and lacked training in de-escalation, um, um, were not particularly knowledgeable about trauma-informed care and um, it was challenging to not have more control over um, administrative discharge decisions and the management of behaviors in that setting. Um, and because of the prevalence of substance use disorders, um, we ran into issues with the shelter um, repeatedly screening our patients for substance use and then they would discharge our patients with unresolved medical issues. And um, this led to many readmissions and medical complications. And we really came to understand um, 
that unless we could keep those with substance use disorders engaged in care, we just would, could really not sufficiently serve our population. And so we came to harm reduction really before that terminology was broadly used out of necessity um, in order to meet our mission goals. So the additional thing that was happening when this became um, more clear to us was that the hospitals um, were experiencing continued barriers with discharging patients living in homeless. And they did a three month analysis and determined that they had many overstay days that were attributed to patients with a higher acuity than could be managed in our shelter-based program um, or with behavioral issues that um, could not readily be managed in our program. So we joined with the public health department in Seattle and um, the downtown Seattle hospitals to plan an alternative program. And it took a number of years. Um, and then in 2011, the Edward Thomas House opened. Um, we are located in a Seattle Housing Authority high rise and we lease one floor of that building. And this is right across the street from the emergency department at our county hospital. Um, we, because we're now a freestanding unit, we were able to um, be the overseers of the milieu management and set the administrative discharge policies. We um, opened very intentionally as a harm reduction program and our patients are able to continue substance use while they're there. They are asked not to use on site and we work to establish therapeutic relationships, focus on safer use habits, and for those that are willing and able to move forward towards treatment, we facilitate that. Um, we also had, have at this program increased medical staffing and increased mental health social work staffing in order to manage a higher acuity, both behaviorally and medically. We have three exam rooms. The photo on the left is one of those exam rooms in, our, in a clinic area. Um, the top right photo is our community space where we serve meals and have yoga groups and mindfulness groups and uh, just community meetings. We have 35 beds and these are in rooms that were previously single room occupancy spaces and we have three beds per room. Our program is, is very collaborative and dependent upon many partners. Um, in terms of the funding, we um, have been, we contract with seven hospitals in the King County area and have contracted with managed care organizations and bill uh, daily rates for respite care. And the hospitals and representatives of the managed care organizations sit on our steering committee that meets on a quarterly basis and reviews data on how many referrals um, were made from each medical center to respite. Sorry about that. Um, and um, how many were accepted and what their length of stay is, what the utilization the is, and talk, Rosa, about, you have one in the talk about program development and get feedback um, on our referral process from the participating medical centers. We also receive county tax money that was slated for mental illness and substance use and we receive health care for the homeless grants through the public health department. A number of years ago, we lost our HUD funding as HUD shifted its resources into housing and away from services. Um, in Seattle, the public health department um, delivers very few direct services, but they act um, rather as a um, funding conduit and they contract with different programs to provide most of the services. So, I work at the county hospital and uh, Harborview Medical Center, and we were contracted to provide the services for medical respite. Other key partners include how some housing programs that um, are off.
offer a back door when patients are ready to discharge. We work um, very much with a case management program that is for medically fragile patients with substance use issues, and um, they have contributed a staff person solely to our program because of the volume of patients that, that fit that bill um, that come through our program. We work very closely with methadone and suboxone programs and are fortunate to be a part of the County Medical Center and um, have access and rely upon all the previously established policies and procedures. And we get tremendous support from the infection control team in the County Hospital and they played a key role in helping us with our COVID response. And additionally, the Respite Care Providers Network is a very key partner in terms of uh, exploring best practices, networking, um, is a very tightly knit group such that we can reach out to programs across the country to get input on how to manage the many challenging issues that arise in running a medical respite program. The core of our staffing um, includes uh, a nurse screener. We do admissions seven days a week and they really act as air traffic controller taking referrals from throughout the county. We have uh, four nursing teams with 12 hour shifts and a medical assistant to assist with the daily nursing visits. We have five mental health professionals um, and one of those professionals does outreach and can follow patients for a three month duration after discharge to respite to secure referrals that might not have been completed. And we have mental health specialists too that are on at a time who serve meals and, and really do intensive milieu management. We have one nurse practitioner on, um, on a daily basis and they do admissions and they address acute medical issues that arise and have um, additional staff noted there. Our lead team is comprised of our program manager, the um, RN3, our mental health supervisor, and, and then myself. And we have weekly meetings to do program planning and process improvement. We take referrals from all over the county. It's not limited just to those hospitals that are contributing members. We try to prioritize emergency department referrals to avert admissions, also work with jail health and take referrals from our shelter-based programs. I'm gonna speed up a little bit so I make sure I have time to address the COVID issues. So um, in terms of our COVID response, we are a relatively small program, but I feel like we um, were able to play a key role in the bigger picture of how that went down in our county. Early on, we determined that we would keep patients who are already in medical respite who tested COVID positive and still had a nursing need, but would not accept new referrals who had not completed isolation. Um, there were early on were barriers to getting patients into the county programs. And so we were involved in the opening of a COVID shelter that was just a block away from respite. And we had staff from that shelter come to medical respite to shadow and learn from our experienced staff. And we also shared staff with that program because they, they were rapidly developed and had new staff who did not necessarily have experience in harm reduction and trauma-informed care. We shared um, our admissions and referral policies and procedures and initiated and spearheaded planning for methadone maintenance and the management of substance use disorders for patients that needed to remain in isolation. Um, the, there were many challenges, including just the increased workload with all the extra cleaning that had to happen. Um, staff time was taken up with non-direct patient care tasks and we needed to limit our census due to that. Um, staff um, who needed to be tested would be out for a period of time pending results and there was a limitation to testing capacity earlier on. Um, and I would say foremost, it's been an ongoing challenge to mitigate the fear that our staff have had around the safety of our patients 
um, in a mixed population of COVID positive and COVID negative patients. And also just fear shared, I think, nationally around um, what is the, the um, most appropriate personal protective equipment that will keep people safe. We um, additionally have patients who are leaving for appointments and methadone maintenance. We have patients that would leave and our staff had a lot of concerns about our patients who are actively using it and had sometimes poorly compensated mental health issues and their ability to remain in isolation as required. We have cancer patients on the unit and um, there are concerns about risks to the immunocompromised patients and um, issues with just the management of drug withdrawals and cravings in isolation. We have been doing weekly surveillance and for those patients, the small number of patients we had um, really limited the direct care, would change our um, dressings to multi-day dressings when appropriate, did a lot of work over the phone. Um, and um, over time, um, there, as we entered the endurance phase, a lot of our county isolation sites with nursing support closed. And I will end with just saying, unfortunately, we, um, in hitting that endurance phase where we had some complacence and a little more ease, we, in the last four days, have had a major outbreak in many shelters, including respite and um, are no longer able to rely upon the programs that have been scaled back. And we are in the process of, of really figuring out how to respond to this um, crisis that didn't happen as we expected initially, but is now happening in our shelters. Um, thank you for your time. Great, thank you so much, Leslie. Um, so I'm gonna ask everyone to come on to their, uh, open their video screens, and we'll start with some um, Q&A. Um, a, a variety of questions coming in around SUD, and I know um, that Leslie addressed this in terms of um, uh, the Edward Thomas House, but just real quick from the rest of you, um, how, how many folks would you say, I would imagine more than 50% have substance use disorder and how are you incorporating or not incorporating harm reduction in your um, efforts? I can go ahead and start. Um, we don't have, uh, it's not a number I've tracked closely, but I would guess like at least 75% of our folks have uh, substance use disorders that come to respite. And this is actually a conversation that we are actively having, I think, especially um, being in the motel and realizing that, you know, there's different challenges now that it's harder for folks to use off-site as they have in the past. And so I think really trying to kind of um, define harm reduction among the staff so that we all kind of have the same working vocabulary of what that means and really focusing on um, if folks are using, what, is, what are the concerns about it? Are there behavioral concerns? Are there safety concerns? Um, and addressing those concerns around it. And of course, um, uh, you know, just continuing to work with them if they are ready to try and enter recovery and offering those resources. But I think, again, focusing on sort of the consequences rather than the actual use. Yeah, and here at Illumination Foundation, we have a substance use team who does an intake for every client who comes in into our medical respite program. And when we looked at our data, it shows about 74% have substance use disorder. And right from the beginning, we had to get all our staff trained in motivational interviewing and trauma-informed care to make sure, you know, everybody sort of really embraced the whole harm reduction model. And, and we continue to do that, but we see a heavy burden of substance use, hence we have to continue to add more substance use um, team members. Leslie? Yeah, we work to develop a protocol to provide medications to manage withdrawal and our pharmacy from the county hospital would deliver the medication. So we were um, rapidly placing patients on Suboxone um, to manage opioid withdrawal, managing alcohol withdrawal of medications, and worked closely with their addictions team to manage that and coordinated with our methadone maintenance programs to deliver methadone on site for those engaged in our programs. Great, thanks. Um, Julia, I'm gonna go ahead and on to the next set of questions, but feel free to um, 
flag me if you want to if you want to respond. Um, um, several questions on uh, cost reduction in, in your study. I believe this was Pooja. Um, can you talk just a little bit more about those findings? Um, did you have a control uh, pre post and um, how are you using those results? Yeah, and this um, data actually comes from our payer, which is Caloptima, the Medi-Cal provider in Orange County. And when we opened our first medical respite program, we worked very closely with their data team. So everything is coming directly from their data analytics. And the slide that I showed where you saw the 92% reduction, the data was looked at six months pre-enrollment to medical respite and six months post. So we worked closely with their data team. We sent them the roster of patients, their intake dates, and they went into their database and pulled all the data and provided those numbers to us. So six months pre and six months post. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is um, trying to weave a couple here together in terms of referrals, working with hospitals. Um, so the first question along these lines is, is around marketing. How long did it take you to get into a steady kind of referral pattern? And when you're working closely with a hospital, maybe a funder, um, what happens if one of their referrals don't get in because you're full? How, do, how does that work in terms of the relationship? I can speak some to that. 75% of our referrals come from our county hospital and we are aware that we have an obligation to serve all the hospitals. From the start, we have been very clear that we prioritize acuity and um, all of our decisions are based upon that. If we have two patients of equal acuity, we typically will prioritize the non-county hospital referral just to make sure that they um, are still feeling adequate access. Anyone else? Yeah, I think similar to Leslie, vast majority of our folks come from the county hospital, but we do wanna try and make sure that um, the other hospitals who do actually help fund our program feel like there is access. Um, so if the referrals are appropriate and um, there's a need, we, we may prioritize that over a county referral at times. Um, and then uh, there was one other part of the question, Kathy, that I'm forgetting. Um, just steady marketing, um, steady. Oh, yeah. I think, I think just finding that there's actually a lot of turnover with um, discharge planners and hospitals. And so, you know, um, we had actually organized uh, regular in services with social workers and case managers to just kind of review, remind them that respite exists and these are the criteria and kind of keep um, folks informed about our program. Yeah, and here at IF, same thing. Our referral team is constantly doing um, education with the social workers who are really getting the phone calls and sometimes don't always have all the medical information. So there's a lot of back and forth, but about 90% of the referrals that we get usually, you know, will get accepted. One of the other things we do here is there's a hospital association of Southern California and they have monthly meetings. And we will have a presentation at those meetings where all the hospital executives are there. Um, and of course, you know, when we don't take a referral, I do get those phone calls and, you know, we'll, we'll look at that. And, and for the most part, it's because they're beyond our level of care. Great. So um, a, a very specific COVID question. I want to make sure to prioritize a couple of these. Um, what did you all do to mitigate staff concerns regarding COVID-19 transmission? So I can start. Um, we very early on actually had all staff webinars where every two weeks we would have meetings with all our staff, answer their questions. We did a lot of emails and every person, you know, coming in, uh, every staff person who had concerns, you know, our HR would field it. And then in many cases, someone from the executive team was fielding those questions and calling the staff member. But it was constant communication webinars, you know, where we were going, um, meet, meeting with all of them and answering their questions. Great. So a couple other questions around um, um, 
the intensity of your care management and framing it around um, maybe FTEs per clients. Can can a couple of you share um, what that you know um, intensity of case management would look like in general? I can say that um, off the top of my head, I don't know the FTE, but we have five mental health practitioners for 35 patients and they work Monday through Friday and focus um, on having people assessed by the vulnerability index to um, place them, see where the placement is on housing. They do um, substance use and mental health referrals um, and then help with just discharge planning because unfortunately we have to discharge from those people to shelters and um, so they're working hard on disposition from day one. So for our therapy staff, our caseload is one to 30 because we are doing a lot of individual therapy and also a lot of group therapy. And for our substance use counselors, it's the same ratio of one to 30. And when we talk about intensive case management, it's 20 to one because they're doing a lot of housing navigation, a lot of housing sustainability. So that case loads decreases and it also depends on the acuity of the patient. So in many cases it's 20 to one. Yeah, I'd say it's similar with our program. I think, you know, I think the typical like intensive case management is like one to 15, one to 20. And we have, um, we are supposed to have 1.5 FTE of social workers for 20 clients, um, which has for the most part worked and we're actually um, understaffed for social work right now. And then again, I think for nursing, having a ratio of about one to 15, um, just to meet the kind of clinical, to provide the clinical support to uh, respite clients. And, and what um, amount of staff have lived experiences or have, you know, come from, um, you know, the community? We recently tracked this number. It's about 30%, but I, I think it's, it's on the higher end. We haven't looked at it um, in the past month or so. I assume that's um, a, a preferable, you know, it's, 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 it's a great way to um, staff or partially staff your your programs with people who are you know very experienced with it. What are some of your? Um, I know we only have a couple minutes, so I'm going to try and fit in one more question here, maybe two. What are some of your follow up practices for medical respite patients? So um, after they've been discharged, how are you able to measure the effectiveness of your practices? So here at IF, because we do our housing um, as well, we will send a team out there to check on them. And it's usually once every week, and sometimes it's more than that. Um, but a minimum touch point, say they were not in our housing and they moved on to another housing with another housing provider, um, what, 30 days we will check in on them. Um, our outreach is limited just to one provider, and he's also following patients who are in the respite program, but we really focus on doing a warm handoff directly to the social worker of a primary care clinic and to their case managers as much as possible. Um, and just wanted to briefly say to the prior question that we are working to develop a peer navigator um, program, which I think will be super key to client success. Great, and then one last quick question, um, using technology. So I had one person specifically ask about HMS, HMIS data uh, being used to coordinate efforts. How, is that your primary source? I presume it's more hospital data, um, but how are you using technology um, or plan to use it as effectively as possible? So for us, because we have so many programs in different counties, we adopted an electronic medical record to really track our data, which unfortunately does not interface with HMIS. So we have to do you know, that work around, but we've needed to have be on an EMR you know, uh, for a while now to make sure we're able to capture all of that. We have a part-time data analyst and our data is integrated into HMIS and work closely with the county and tracking our outcomes. Um, we, our EHR is limited in terms of data harvesting now, but we're transitioning to a new system that will be much better. 
And I would say we're, um, you know, while we're on HMIS, I think being on the county EMR, which is EPIC, uh, has been really helpful from a clinical care coordination perspective. It actually really allows um, for the, there to be a lot of fluid communication between different care providers. Great. Well, I have to tell you, you, you three are ready to sign up for a game show or something because you're very good at rapid fire answering these questions. I feel like we probably got through about 15 questions, um, some of them, you know, grouped together. So thank you all so much, um, Leslie, Sara, Pooja, Julia. Thank you so much. This has been a really um, informative and rich presentation. Thank you for your time. Um, Michelle, I'd like to thank you and the California Healthcare Foundation for supporting this webinar and bringing everyone together. And um, please do reach out if you feel like you did not get, uh, you have a, a pressing question, please reach out to myself or Julia and um, we'll be happy to uh, answer your question or connect you with a resource and um, you can reach me at chcs.org. Um, so thank you all so much. We're really thrilled to um, have such a great turnout. I think we had at least 350 or so on this call today. So um, uh, thank you all for joining and have a great rest of your day. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.